coming out of this on the other side, nurse powered politics needs to be a thing and more nurses and more healthcare professionals need to speak out on these issues that directly affect us. We need more healthcare professionals on the Senate floor, bottom line. Hi everyone, and welcome back to COVID-19 Heroes. I'm your host, Lorraine Schneider, and today I am joined by Monique Hernandez. Monique is a charge nurse working for a trauma center in Riverside, California. She shares what the last few weeks of the COVID response have been like, and we discuss the role and future of activism, labor unions, and creating lasting change through advocacy. Hi, Monique. Thank you for being on today's show of COVID-19 Heroes. Welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. Monique, you are a charge nurse currently working for a level two trauma center in Riverside, California. What does trauma level two signify and how have the first few weeks of the COVID response been for you and your team? So yes, I am a charge nurse of a tele unit, um, meaning we take care of patients that are on heart monitors. Um, Level two means we have comprehensive adult services, orthoplastics, We're a stroke center. We also are a STEMI center, which means like if you're having a heart attack, come to us. When we didn't have the COVID patients in the beginning, my hospital began to unfortunately cut staff. And just because we weren't having the COVID patients, our problem was, you know, that doesn't mean that strokes stop happening. That doesn't mean that heart attacks stop happening. And when you have skeleton crew staffing, you're putting patients you know, and the community at risk. A great example was like Easter weekend when there was one lab technician or a phlebotomist, if you will, on shift that morning. And the next person, we had a timed lab draw that is a critical lab patient that is on a heparin drip. Um, We need a timed lab draw and heparin is a drug that thins the blood. And it was 12 o'clock. It was due for that lab draw, and she was on the COVID unit with the COVID patient. So she's she called and said, I'm sorry, Mo, I'm not going to, I can't come back. And so the next person didn't come in until two. That's unsafe. So it's, you know, yes, our census was low in the beginning, but when you cut essential staff, ancillary staff that you need, you're not giving like the best care that you can give. Um, so it's really debilitating to like the nurses and the, re- and the respiratory therapists that are there and trying to give the best care, you know, that we can give. But it's like our hands were tied behind our backs. I was so alarmed when I started seeing that healthcare workers were being let go of their workplaces because of all of the um, elective surgeries and, and so on and so forth that were were stopped and it just didn't make any logical sense to me to see that happening and it's incredible as we're having this pandemic and we're celebrating our our healthcare heroes seeing the flip side of that i think after all this people will really open their eyes at least that's my that's my prayer <laughs> that people open their eyes to like the healthcare industry and we just start questioning why in 2018, when we have, I I believe it was Proposition 8, um, the dialysis proposition, right? When you're on dialysis in America, no one is refused dialysis if they need it. So a dialysis clinic is basically like a public good in in a way, right? So when we're trying to put a cap on how profitable a dialysis clinic can be with that proposition, like it's a public It's a public service in a way. It's a public good, like schools or roads or parks, right? Or like law enforcement. That bill failed (laughs) thanks to DeVita, who profits off of privatized dialysis centers. So it's like I really hope that people just start opening their eyes to what is important to them versus what should be important to all of us and what we kind of need to start taking a little bit more seriously as far as healthcare goes. 
taking that into consideration and then the lack of PPE that, you know, was taking place, not just in the U.S., but really worldwide. How do you hope that hospitals across the country will change their practices moving forward? What are some other areas that require improvement? Look at big pharma, right? Look at your cost of insulin, (laughs) Why am I giving coupons to people for insulin? And even with a coupon, a vial of Lantus insulin will run you without insurance, $200. But you can get it from Canada for like $50. And then the words of like PPE, why was the U.S. so like wildly unprepared? Wildly across the nation, we were unprepared for this. My hospital alone, like, We had zero PAPRs in the beginning of this, but other hospitals in our area, such as like county and the VA, they do because they have a feasible disaster plan and they are held accountable to have. So yeah, they can put more people in their PAPRs. And I think it just, it should open everyone's eyes to see like it's their job to protect their employees, right? And for me personally, honestly, we were failed on a national level because OSHA has failed us. And I think the CDC failed us. The CDC changed the requirements, not based on the science and the evidence-based research of what we needed. They based it on what there was available. So this whole situation, I think, is just been eye-opening and the list of improvements that need to happen across the nation is very long. And But if California can start and maybe set that bar, I fully believe that we could. California is, we set the bar as far as um, nursing ratios go, meaning a nurse ratio is how many patients that nurse can care for safely within like their specialty unit. So tele, where I said I work, we're a four to one. ICU is typically two patients to one nurse, or if they're critical, they're um, one-to-one. Sometimes even they're two nurses to one patient. So California did that. You know, we set the ratio bar, so to speak. And I think there will be so much change so that this never happens again. I agree with you. I think there is going to be a lot of after-action reports across the country and I don't think the lack of PPE will ever exist like that again. It will be up to seeing what other things are out there that need to be handled and need to be corrected. So hopefully we can learn from our mistakes. A thousand percent. I don't think we'd ever, we will ever have this issue again. It's sad that we're having it now, but sometimes things have to happen to invoke change. You have done quite a bit of of activism over the last few weeks for your nurses to protect them and keep them all healthy. Um, What have you learned about activism over the past few weeks? And did you consider yourself an activist before? And do you think you will continue to be socially and politically engaged in the nursing cause in the future? I never considered myself an activist I guess I kind of put it, you know, I always consider myself like, oh, I have a lot of opinions and I have a big mouth. Um, So I think now I'm like, okay, I'm an activist. Um, I think seeing now, like in moving forward, it's humbling to see like the community get behind you. I put together a silent protest for like my hospital when we were just We needed equal PPE for all units. My hospital was trying to subscribe to a clean, you know, there was clean units units versus dirty units. And and it's like, no, I was having nurse outbreaks and there's nurses getting sick on my floor and we were supposed to be designated the clean floor. And like, oh, well, the COVID units aren't, you know, those nurses aren't getting sick. Yes, well, they are protected. They have more PPE than we did. So I was surprised at like when we had our silent protest, just the community coming by honking the police, the um, police officers were called on us to survey us and they brought us donuts and um, waters. And so I think just the level of support and like moving from here forward, 
nothing has ever wavered for me. Nothing's been more important in my practice than patient safety, equally as much as the safety of my coworkers. My coworkers are not just my coworkers. I've been a nurse for 11 years. These are people that I've known for 11 years. I've spent Christmases with them. We go to each other's birthday parties. You know, it's, I consider them an extension of my immediate family. So when they were falling ill, yes, I took it very personal and I will continue to do so. So I think speaking out, there's nothing more important than patient safety. There's nothing more important than healthcare, healthcare worker safety. I'm not, I'm not just talking about the nurses. I'm talking about my assigned EVS lady, like her name is Rosa. Like I, I love that woman. She's has to be, she's probably in her sixties, you know, she's still working. She's cleaning our rooms. And there I see her with, you know, just like the paper thin level one mask. That's not okay. So yes, I, I guess I fully, (laughs) I'm fully subscribing to me being a activist now and I will continue to do so. I think Coming out of this on the other side, nurse powered politics needs to be a thing, and more nurses and more healthcare professionals need to speak out on these issues that directly affect us. We need more healthcare professionals on the Senate floor, bottom line, so that we can say what is happening and what we are seeing within the walls of the hospital. Too many times, you know, there's um, people involved in bills and right, but in you know, past legislation that. You know, this, this has to do with my job and, you know, in my profession, with all due respect, let me tell you what I need and what I see and my opinion, you know, and my experience will be valued. I think you make a great point talking about bills and, and policies and legislation as everything that we do in in society falls back on those. How do you foresee the collaboration between elected officials and subject matter experts, healthcare workers moving forward? I think this is a huge part. This is a huge opportunity for nurse unions. I am honored to be a part of SCIU One to One RN, where we did um, get our bill passed last year, Senate Bill 227. Um, which is like our stop repeat offender hospital bill. And I think with this all coming forward, like I think nurse unions, healthcare worker unions, it'll be bigger than ever and more um, essential than ever to have one, to be a part of one. They really help get our voices heard on the Senate floor and get us connected with the senators. And I think nationwide, I think people that don't, belong to a union they're seeing you know like that kind of wish they were especially in the sense of not having enough PPE not having the proper PPE so I think nurse unions I think healthcare worker unions in general will be huge moving forward what is something positive that you have learned about yourself during the pandemic what will you take from this experience I never realized the power I had to like engage people when the silent protest was getting put together and, you know, people were calling because everyone's scared to show up that morning. Right. You you think, I think people were calling me individually and they're thinking, Oh my gosh, I'm going to get there. And it's just going to be me and Mo, (laughs) you know, I'm like, no, no, you know, like (laughs) more people are coming. I promise. I promise. And then as the two sides of the street filled up and as people and as the community were, driving by and honking. And we had the support of, I mean, the passer buyers, you know, truck drivers, we had iron workers out there. We had other locals. I had elected officials that I had called that I had reached out to before, and they came out to support us. I think for my new grads, I think that was huge. And having like my um, executive director of my union there, I mean, just showing that support gave a bigger sense of community and a bigger sense of support, which I want to scream it. (laughs) I want to scream it at these new, you know, these newer nurses that, you know, we are supported. We are one of the most trusted professionals. So it's, you know, I think that's huge. And I think moving forward, like that's my takeaway is like just having a sense of pride in that 
and just encouraging the new grad nurse and every nurse out there that is afraid to speak up and speak out. I think from nursing school, the word HIPAA is ingrained in us and that has to do with patient privacy, right? But I think we get it confused with with the fact that we can speak up and speak out if we are not working in a safe workplace. You know, that is not a HIPAA violation. A HIPAA violation, it has to do with the patient. We cannot talk about patients, but we can talk about unsafe work practices, unsafe workplaces. So I think that takeaway and just engaging nurses and just getting us to get involved, that's my takeaway. I love that you have been able to find the power within your voice during all of this. So Monique, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Thank you for everything that you're doing, you and all of your fellow nurses and and other healthcare workers. Um, We're beyond grateful. I thank you for having this podcast, giving us like a platform to, to use our voice. This is huge. I'd like to close off this episode by thanking Monique and all healthcare heroes out there who are continuing to fight for the health of their patients and their own. It takes courage to find your voice and speak up. It is also important for us to never lose sight of what's right and needed, whether we're in the midst of a pandemic or not. Monique mentioned the 2018 California Proposition 8, which related to limits on dialysis clinics revenue and required refunds. New health care bills are constantly introduced on the state and federal level. Let's pay attention and make all of our voices heard by educating ourselves and casting our ballots. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, feel free to leave a review and subscribe to the show. Thank you, and until next time, I'm your host, Lorraine Schneider. <laughs>